Hey folks, I'm Jim Hansen, Uncle Jimbo. I write for uh, Black5.net, and I am honored to be here this morning uh, with the National Heroes Tour from Vets for Freedom. Uh, fantastic group. We're traveling across the country trying to make sure that the voices of those who have served in Iraq and Afghanistan get heard, and also to make sure that uh, when we arrive April 8th in D.C., we will be doing the Troops on the Hill event and supporting General Petraeus' testimony, talking about what's actually happening on the ground in Iraq, as opposed to what the media would have us believe is happening on the ground. So those two different events will be knitted together <laughs> quite, uh, quite entertainingly, we're hoping. Um, I, I guess I'd like to say, we're here at Fort Bragg, and uh, this is, obviously, I'm former Army Special Forces. This place means a lot to me for one reason. This is a place where people understand what the long war is. All right, now, a lot of people right now are, are talking about we need to finish up in Iraq, we need to come home, the troops need to come home, and basically, the war needs to end. Well, you don't end wars. You either win them or lose them. You know, and if we come home now, I'm not sure we could chalk it up as a victory, so I'm not sure it's a good idea. So part of the reason we are here is so folks who've been on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan can talk about that and tell people it's been a difficult fight. It hasn't always gone well, but we're in it to win it. And that's the bottom line. I mean, that's where we stand. That's what we're talking about. And that's the nonpartisan message that Vets for Freedom and the National Heroes Tour is putting out. I guess uh, my personal experience with, uh, with insurgency started almost 20 years ago. As a matter of fact, it was darn near 19 years to the day. Um, I had just graduated from the Q course here at Fort Bragg. And my first deployment was to the Republic of the Philippines. Great place to visit. People, uh, people like to think of it as, a, as an entertaining place. When we got there, it was in the throes of, a, of an insurgency. Not an Islamist one. Oddly enough, it was a Maoist, communist insurgency called the New People's Army. And uh, folks here from Fort Bragg probably remember the name Nick Rowe. Colonel Nick Rowe was an Army Special Forces officer who was captured during Vietnam early on in the conflict and spent five years escaping from prison camps, getting caught, getting tortured, escaping again, caught, tortured. It was a cycle he did and he wrote a book about it called Five Years to Freedom. He eventually escaped and became, he retired in 1974, was recalled to active duty because of the fact that there was active insurgencies going on in the Pacific Rim. Colonel Rowe volunteered again to serve, and he was in the Philippines when I arrived there on my first deployment. He met us in Manila. He threw us a barbecue and a great party. You know, and there I was, uh, I'm, I'm meeting a hero of Army Special Forces. It was a, it was a highlight of my life. And five days later, he was shot, killed by Maoist insurgents called the New People's Army in the Philippines. Now, that was a, that was a horrifying blow to us. Because not only, I mean, my first deployment, I mattered nothing. But the rest of the people in my unit had known this man for a long time, knew what he was doing. And it was, it was a horrendous blow to all Army Special Forces and Special Operations worldwide. Now, normally I would stop the story there, but we're at Bragg. So I can tell a little bit farther was the fact that my team, and there were four teams and a B team deployed at that point in time. Uh, we got a visit from a Filipino Special Forces team that we were associated with. They, uh, they kind of let us know they knew where some of the insurgents were. Now, the Philippine Constitution forbids US <laughs> forces from conducting combat operations, as did our rules of engagement and the, uh, the orders we were under. So we packed our gear, <laughs> we loaded our guns, and it was about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. Uh, we loaded for bear, and we were rolling out of the base camp we were sitting on, obviously on our way with, uh, with the Filipino Special Forces to go pay some retribution. Um, well, <laughs> our Sergeant Major, <laughs> fortunately, uh, had read the Filipino Constitution <laughs> and our, our orders and rules of engagement, and he stopped us at the gate and confiscated our weapons and <laughs> sent us back to our little tent with nothing but sidearms going, you guys probably shouldn't do that. So <laughs> fortunately, an international incident was avoided, but the bottom line was that was 19 years ago, and that was an insurgency against the United States and one of our allies. My point being, this is a long war. All right, this is not something where we can just go ahead, kill a few bad guys, and make it go away. That's not true. That's why people at Special Forces Command and in the course here spend time learning about guerrilla warfare, spend time learning about counterinsurgency, and actually understand that it's, a, it's basically, it boils down to winning the hearts and minds of the people and not just killing the bad guys. You have to secure the people, you have to live amongst the people, and fortunately, you know, last year, January, we, uh, we appointed General Petraeus as the commander MNF Iraq, and we changed our strategy from nation building from the top down 
to counterinsurgency at a tribal level from the ground up. That was a, a tremendous change and it was effective. And we're about to hear General Petraeus again on April 8th is going to speak in front of Congress and testify. And like last year when uh, Senator Clinton suspended willful disbelief, well, she's gonna have a hard time doing that now. The facts on the ground say that sectarian violence is down 90% year over year. Every factor that you can point at in Iraq is looking in the right direction right now. And General Petraeus is gonna say that. He's also gonna tell them that it's not over. And that's really our point. All right, it is not over. We're winning, but we have not won. And that's the point. We want to let the troops win. And we're just asking Congress and our leaders to go ahead and, and allow that to happen as opposed to putting political points above the fact that we have committed troops, we have consecrated that ground with their blood, and we owe it to them to make sure that we win. Um, I'd like to point out we've got some gold star wives here. Uh, met you folks in Nashville. It was, it was tremendous to meet you. I appreciate you coming out this morning. Uh, one of the things we promised you then is that part of the reason we're doing this is to make sure that the sacrifices that your husbands made will not be forgotten. Their names will not be forgotten, and their children will be able to stand tall and say, my father served in the war on terror, and he made a difference. All right, so thank you, ladies, for coming out. We greatly appreciate that. <clears throat> we're going to open up this morning, and uh, they don't know what order I'm going to introduce them in, so <laughs> we're going to see who, who jumps up first, Tom. <laughs> Bottom line, first person I'm going to introduce is uh, Gunner Tom Parks. And if you're not familiar with the Marine Corps, uh, there are not a lot of Marine Corps gunners. Tom is one, and there's a reason. They take people who have earned their stripes, who have done their time on the ground, and who have become experts in the art of combat as a Marine Corps NCO. Uh, when those people show themselves as someone who has risen above the normal, they get promoted to chief warrant officer and known as a Marine gunner. Tom Parks won the Silver Star in Iraq for being crazy enough to shoot a missile at a tank and knock it out. And uh, Tom, did you not shoot a man in the head? Do you like telling that to school children, I've heard? <laughs> that you like to remind them that it's, it is part of the healing process. He tells the children that he did shoot the man in the head. The bottom line is Gunner Tom Parks has served five combat tours, one in Afghanistan, two in Iraq, and a couple in interesting places we won't mention. Uh, he knows what combat is like, he knows how difficult it is, and he knows what we're doing and why, in the end, we will win. So, ladies and gentlemen, Gunner Tom Parks. Well, I expected more folks to be here. However, it's good to be back in, in Fayetteville, uh, and it's, uh, it's good to be with warriors. Being with warriors is, is something that I haven't been doing for about two and a half years. I retired from the Marine Corps uh, two and a half years ago, and, and the gunfight I'm in in the corporate world is, is a hell of a lot tougher than anything that I've experienced in my life. What I, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Charles, I appreciate everything you do. Military.com is a, is a great organization. You can find fantastic resources there, and I have, uh, as far as my healing process is concerned. And how do we download that? And you, uh, you probably won't see my bio in the, in the press packet or anything like that. But I'm going to tell you why I'm here and what I've been doing. Uh, for two and a half years, just kind of marking time, hanging out. And I wanted to be able to give back. My wife's uh, still in the Marine Corps. She happens to be the prettiest and the toughest Marine in the Marine Corps. And uh, so I, I stay connected, however, not with warriors. Uh, in Can we live in Kansas City, and so we're not as, uh, I'm not able to, to relate with like kind people uh, outside in the world. Uh, I normally don't tell my story, but for some reason to an elementary school, I told it yesterday, and it, it was a great healing process for me. However, they, they made up this fictitious radio interview to keep me from the K through three grades so that I ensure that to ensure that they didn't have nightmares that night. So in the past couple of days, I've been able to relate and, and speak with uh, veterans that have just come home uh, from 82nd Airborne and, and other units that are in this area. Uh, that's a special thing for me as far as my healing process is concerned and what I've downloaded over a, a, a lengthy career, uh, a, being able to stand and deliver on the art of the possible 
when we start talking about progress and what we've been doing over there. The progress that has taken place, and I served uh, two tours in Iraq and, and one in Afghanistan, so I believe that I have the moral authority to be able to talk about what we were doing wrong. However, what we're doing now and what we're doing right and what you don't see on CNN or, and or in the newspapers is, is just astonishing to me. As far removed as I am, I'm able to understand at least that when you put these individuals together, and in 04, we were training the Iraqis, Iraqi security forces, and most of you know that, but it was, I likened it uh, before I was evacuated uh, due to injuries, I likened the training of the Iraqi security forces to potty training my children. And it was just incredibly, and if you've dealt with this, you know what I'm talking about. The fact that they stood, some of them, last week against the Mahdi army, and if you've ever fought against the Mahdi army, you understand what I'm talking about. When we were training these folks, they were in the barracks or tents that we housed them in. They were cutting each other's throats at the middle of the night because I'm a Shia, you're a Sunni. So uh, rifling through it and attempting to train these people, and I've, I've said other things, but... I'll keep it clean, Jimbo. The, uh, trying to train them and seeing the progress that has been made now, is it perfect? No. Uh, 40 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King was shot. And what would he say today? He'd say, hey, we, we've done pretty well. However, we have progress to be made. And I think that's, that's still where we are right now. However, if we just cut rope, we take our rucksacks off and come home, that would be, that would be a, a great disservice to myself, a great disservice to my brothers and sisters that have served and given the ultimate sacrifice, as well as what is going on over there right now. Progress is being made. We're turning electricity on. We're, uh, you know, things, things that these uh, lady and gentlemen are gonna tell you about more recently are taking place. Why, why do I do this? Why do I hang out with Vets for Freedom, personally, again, it's a healing process for me. Uh, professionally, it allows me to get the word out to whether it's one human being or it's 400 human beings in, in a doggone uh, a facility like this. It's, it, it gives us the ability to share with you some of our experiences, some of the hope and the strength that's going on. But our military service members need to be supported. And if we don't support them, then we cannot win. And Jimbo put it really well. It's my professional pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't give you the elementary school version of shooting a guy in the head, but it's very similar to the uh, sh fighting in the men's room here, or the women's room, I'd imagine. But fighting in a room that size is, uh, you know, that'll, that'll leave a couple of scars on you. However, military.com, Vets for Freedom, you know, we're making progress, and, and if folks use the resources that are out there to get help and they tell their stories and tell of the progress that's being made, then we're all going to be a lot better for that. But thank you for hearing me. Thanks. And Tom makes a, a couple of excellent points that I think are, are part of the focus that we have on the tour is People come home and everybody's affected. Nobody goes to combat and come back the same person. All right, PTSD is, gets a lot of, of air time these days and it should. It's vital that we take care of folks who've been affected. But the bottom line, anybody who's been to combat has some sort of PTSD. I mean, it's a continuum. You start here, you saw horrific things and it goes all the way to is it affecting you and can you live your life? Well, everybody who's been to combat is somewhere along that continuum and part of what we're doing is making sure that they're not ostracized, that they're not treated as outcasts because of the fact that they've seen the horrors of war. Unfortunately, yes, they have. Fortunately, like Tom said, military.com, Vets for Freedom, and people like that are paying attention and saying, yeah, we understand. All right, yes, it was horrible, but you're home now, and hopefully this will end in a good way. If not, we're still gonna treat everybody as they deserve as returning warriors. So I'm um, honoring the fallen and taking care of those who've come home are things that matter a lot to all of us. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce someone that I think it makes a very kind of poignant statement just by the fact 
of her service. Kate Norley served with the 1st Cavalry Division in combat as a combat medic. Now, anybody who knows the enemy we're fighting, Islamic extremism, they don't even allow girls to go to school. All right, so we're talking about showing them straight up face to face that Americans aren't like that. We value all our citizens, men, women, children, and we treat them all fairly and freely, and we allow people like Kate Norley to serve as a medic in our army. And that right there is a stark contrast between America and our enemies. So I'd like to introduce Kate Norley, and she can tell you a little about what happened to her and what she did uh, in Iraq. Jimbo, thank you for the compliment on my skirt. Um, I know you. I know you've seen many, so um, I would. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I would just like to start off by thanking you for having us all here today. Um, I, uh, I, speaking of skirts, I mean, for one thing in particular, I am extremely proud and honored to to be the official skirt alongside Jimbo um, on this tour. It uh, it's something that. I wish I had seen more of uh, right before I joined, and that it hadn't been, uh, you know, had it not been for 9/11 and the terrorist attacks, who knows, who knows where I would be right now? I don't know if I would have had that call to duty. But fortunately, I did have my call to duty, and I, uh, I'm very big on, you know, continuing to serve. That service never ends. And I spent uh, four years was my initial commitment. I'm now currently um, finishing my degree as a physician's assistant in Washington. And my goal is to go back in the service, to not stop. Um, and this is kind of a, a midway section that I'm able to travel, you know, with these amazing soldiers, airmen, marines, just he absolute heroes. Um, and heroes not just, you know, what they did on the, quote unquote, battlefield, but heroes in their own lives. I mean, the character of these men right here is just, um, there's far and few between. And I, I'm just really, really honored to uh, be along with them. As far as my story, I served with the uh, First Cav Division, uh, sent out of Fort Hood, Texas. I usually like to um, try and gain some notoriety by saying that we have the biggest patch. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with that, so that's that's something that you know. At least I can say I, that's something big that I have. Um, and those of you, <laughs> yeah, you know military. Um, <laughs> As far as my involvement, um, when I was deployed, there was a, a range of things. I'm going to spare you guys from the elementary version of, not that I shot anyone in the head, um, as Jimbo and <laughs> Tom referenced, but uh, I'll spare you from the chicken dance that I taught to the kindergarten through third graders yesterday, because um, that was kind of my go-to thing. The other medics had known that I had been in that area when all the little kids came running out doing this. and so. Um, I was on a lot of uh, routine patrols, um, responded to uh, ambushes that were anything that was, I was with a mobile, more ambulatory unit, so I was constantly getting attached and then detached and moving around. I had the privilege of meeting with a lot of uh, Army snipers and kind of combination of, I guess my goal, I was, sort of, was intended the task was to be somewhat of a I guess kind of like a cheerleader, kind of to go and seek them out and just see how they were doing, um, tell them to keep going and, and collect any data that they had for me that I could later take to some of the um, higher ups that were um, in the medical field and theater at the time. So I had the privilege of doing that. I also, um, aside from you know doing my best to patch up soldiers and, and bring them back, I also uh, myself experienced firsthand what, what combat was. I had seen it so many times every time you know, I heard medic, I was down there on the ground, and aside from making sure that, you know, someone either was coherent or had a pulse, and then, of course, as all the gentlemen knew, the first thing they wanted to know is, is my, you know, what, still attached. And, of course, I, you know, did my best to let them know, yes, I'm, I'm sure it's fine. But I, too, um, was hit when I was providing aid, and uh, it's something that I know a lot of, a lot of women are, are not... Um, <coughs> Able, able to share their stories if they've, if they've survived that story. But I actually, uh, I, keep, I keep that round that hit me right in the center of my, of my plates, um, on my dog, dog tags, I keep them close to me. Um, because I too know what it feels like to not only serve others, but also just the fear of who's gonna take care of me? Who's gonna, who's, who's gonna help me out? When I was 
knocked on my back and worried, you know, not about anything being in its right place or not, but am I going to be able to stand up and, and continue after this? Um, so that's something, you know, that I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to share with you now, and I also was very fortunate that I was surrounded by, whether they were medics or not, everybody there said, you know, Kate, you're fine. Um, there's no blood. Get up. Let's go. There's other people. Um, so I took care of that. I'm very proud of that. But I also, as far as the successes to kind of, you know, give you the show and tell, I, um, I met with some local Iraqi women that were attending Baghdad University, which um, I'm not recruiting for them today, um, but I'm sure, you know, there's other universities here in the States that might be more fitting. But the women there, there was a class of about the size of 15 that were allowed to attend, um, and they, someone threw civil affairs in, in one of the units that I was attached to. They had asked them, you know, would you guys, you guys are brave enough to continue, you know, to, to come to this university, to come and try and receive an education. Um, would you like to meet an American woman, an American soldier? And there were about five or eight or so that, you know, were interested in that. And I got to speak with them, and it was, uh, I got to be honest, it was, it was awkward. It was, uh, I didn't know where to start. Um, it, it was, talk about, you know, foreign or, or you know, people having <laughs> an unbelievable amount of differences between each other. Um, you know, one, once we started to kind of sort out through that with the translator that was alongside me, we realized um, between all of us that, you know, obviously we all were women, um, but that there was a sense of, of not only pride for being a woman, but also for someone that, you know, uh, could be courageous and someone that could, um, you know, whether they had a degree or not, or they lived in a third world country where they, you know, suffered under the regime of Saddam, that they could continue and just not to stop. And I was able to share with them kind of, you know, our, our way of, of thinking as far as we will never give up. You know, we've been fortunate to have, you know, some of, some support um, from our own Americans here back in the States, but to not stop and to, to try and tell these women to hold on to the hope that they had and, you know, wish you the best of luck. Don't stop. Um, said a few prayers under my breath as I left, wishing them, wishing them well. And that was about four years ago now. About a month ago, I was invited to attend um, the International Women's Appreciation Conference at our nation's capital at the White House. And our president awarded about nine females uh, from around the world with awards for their courage and valor, um, you know, despite the most extreme um, circumstances of their native countries. And afterwards, there was uh, an Iraqi woman that had been recognized. So during the reception, you know, I wanted to go seek her out and kind of say hi, shake her hand. She turned around, and the two of us were completely blown away by each other. It was, I've met you before, which was, you know, kind of the last place I'm thinking when I was at the White House, I was going to meet an Iraqi woman that I recognized. And after a moment, she said to me, in perfect English, she said, you're the American woman that came and spoke to us at the University of Baghdad. And I said, oh my, oh my God. And she said, I, I want to let you know that I never forgot about that meeting. And um, that's what, that's something that I was able to hold on to, to get me where I am now. And I am, um, I'm going to be not only always holding on to what we spoke about at the university, but I'm going to take this back to the rest of the women and, and the men in Iraq right now and tell them how this circle, uh, the story just came full circle. Um, and it, I mean, that to me, if that's not progress, if that's not a, just a small piece of success, then, then I don't know, you know, what is, because the probability of that occurring was, you know, slim to none. So with that said, I, um, I just, I just want to thank you. I'm so grateful for my service. I'm grateful to be able to have the opportunity to tell my story, to share, you know, my side, not only, you know, as a veteran, but it also, you know, as, as a female that is honored enough to, to serve with, with these gentlemen beside me. Um, and, and to leave on, on one, one last story, when uh, Jimbo, you specifically mentioned um, Al-Qaeda and their total disrespect for, for women. Um, I did have another privilege along the way of after... Um, a certain insurgent had, uh, had, been, had been taken under our, our care. As we dragged him back to, uh, to the local FOB, my, uh, my convoy commander said, you know, you know Kate, I, I want you to come back while we you know, start some of the interrogation. I was thinking, okay, well, I didn't know if I was going to need my aid bag or not. Um, but either way, I came over and he said, uh, when, we, when we take uh, the cloth off his eyes, I, w I want you to take your Kevlar off. And I want you. I want you to take your bun off, and I want you to take, you know, 
what looked like a ski mask that I was wearing because you know there was a high price for the lighter haired individuals, especially American women over there. So as he took it off, the guy was going nuts and da da da, and the and the translator is saying he's saying this, he's going to kill us all, blah blah blah, and. Uh, you know, I, you'll never, you'll never get through to me. As soon as they they took off the blind, I looked down and I said, "Hi," I said, "Masalama, peace be with you." And he looked at me, and he screamed. Um, and he, the translator put it, he said, "Kill me now." So, <laughs> I'm I'm grateful to have have shown him that yes, um, be afraid, be very afraid. Uh, there's there's more of us out there. Um, but I just thank you for your support and please. Uh, you know, please don't give up on us because we sure as hell would never give up on you. Thank you. <laughs> now, if that doesn't remind you how to win the long war, I don't know what will. <laughs> All right? Because that would be my favorite weapon right there is uh, scare him with the blonde hair. Not that I can do it, but fortunately we have Kate to handle that. Next person who's going to come up and speak is uh, Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Work. You actually been promoted? But you're on the list. Why won't they promote you? Because he's trouble. Yeah, because he's a Marine who will not get a proper haircut high and tight is why. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Staff Sergeant Promotable, Jeremiah Workman. He, uh, he had the opportunity to go serve in Iraq. Instead, he decided to go to Canada and become a conscientious objector. Oh, wait, no, that's not the story. Hold on. <laughs> no, Jeremiah, as a matter of fact, as opposed to being a conscientious objector, was pretty much the opposite of that. Uh, he was serving in Fallujah when the city was reopened, uh, when we decided we were gonna let all the folks back in and allow them to go back to their homes because we're nice, kind Americans. Well, uh, some of the folks who came back in were the bad guys. And they, uh, they had a house rigged up, loaded with explosives, filled with bad guys, and uh, some of Jeremiah's squad got pinned down there. And, uh, Unfortunately, rather than conscientiously objecting to their presence, he kept walking back in the building, running back in the building, and killing bad guys. And a couple dozen insurgents died. Jeremiah got as many of his Marines out as he could, and uh, he was awarded the Navy Cross for that, second only to the Medal of Honor. It's, uh, it's a tremendous story. It's also going to be a book called Shadows of the Sword, or Shadows from the Sword, we're not sure. Shadows from the Sword. It's a story not just of the combat in Fallujah, but the difficulty he had coming back and trying to reintegrate the civilian life. Uh, difficult, trying situation, however, he's sitting here today telling his story in a, in a positive light as opposed to being beaten down by events. So that's really, we want to remind people that no matter what you saw, no matter what you did, uh, you can make it through, and uh, if you need some help, there's folks to help you. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremiah Workman. Good morning. I want to thank everybody for coming out today in the rain and listening to us stand up here and bump our gums. <laughs> Pittsburgh Steelers, that's the first Steelers fan I've seen on the entire tour, so thank you for coming out. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, when I joined the Marine Corps, I wanted, there was a couple of things that I wanted to achieve. One was to become an NCO. Two, I wanted to lead Marines in combat. Um, and that was about it. The rest, the rest of it has been icing on the cake. But, you know, luckily I had the opportunity to go to Fallujah during the, the second battle, the big battle of Fallujah, and I had the pleasure and honor of leading other human beings, other Marines in combat. Um, like Jimbo was you know, telling you, it was December 23rd, 2004, and they had just opened the city back up. I mean, we'd been heavy combat in the city for two, three weeks, and it was time to let the people come home. Um, we opened it back up at 8 o'clock in the morning. And at 9 o'clock, I had my guys. We were just going through the houses trying to get the rest of the ammo and the weapons caches picked up so they couldn't come right back in and start shooting at us on day one. And uh, we got to the house, and there was roughly 30 of them waiting upstairs in the house. There was, When you got upstairs inside this house, there was a, there was a couple bedrooms, but there was... Uh, Two of the walls in the house had the big, tall, wooden oak closets, and then the other two walls were stacked from the ground to the, to the ceiling with blankets. And one of my Marines opened the closet, and as soon as he opened the door, they just started jumping out everywhere. I mean, so I had to make a decision at that time, were we going to stay in, you know, 
was, was we're going to get the Marines that were that were wounded, and uh, unfortunately we lost three guys in there, get them out, and then call it an air. Or we could stay in the house and fight and kill every single one of them. Yes, shoot them in the head. And so they couldn't live to fight another day and kill another one of our Marines. So as a group, you know, we chose to stay and fight. And for three hours, we stayed in that house. We fought. Um, I watched very, you know, very heroic, and you know, human beings. I mean, that's what got me through the day. I, I was wounded. I was hit with three different grenades, and you know, had bullets skip off my calf. And I started to feel sorry for myself, just because. I mean, I was I was ready to, <laughs> you know, exit stage left. And I turned around. And one of my Marines was shot in the arm, and. Uh, I watched him lift up. I mean, he, he had no use of his arms, so he tried to lift his 16 back up with his good hand and continue firing at the insurgents. He didn't have the strength or the energy, so he dropped his rifle and he pulled the pistol out of a Marine in front of him, his holster, and continued firing at the insurgents. And that right there is what got me through that fight. I mean, watching human beings like Philip Levine, um, if I was in charge, you know, every single one of those Marines would have a Medal of Honor, but that just tells you about the quality of the Marines and the soldiers, sailors, and airmen that we have in our service today. Um, you know, they're unbelievable human beings. We believe in what we're doing, and that's why I'm out here on this tour. Um, I don't like the word heroes uh, or hero. You know, Tiger Woods is a hero. You know, he's won, what, five golf matches in a row? My God. Um, but it, it's very, it, it's an honor and it's humbling to be out here with warriors like this um you know being able to tell tell my story with these with these ladies with the lady and the gentleman um but it's all about getting out and looking you looking at you folks in the eye and saying thank you for what you're doing thank you for supporting us and, and at the end of the day you guys are are a, a tool i mean we we can use you to help spread the word and filter this down the word out to even more people and that's that's what we that's what it's going to take to win this to win this war um people ask all the time you know i get it all the time i'm sure everybody else up here does do you think we can win the war well hell yeah i i, I think we can win the war uh, what do you want me to say um so by us getting out here and being able to talk to you guys and look you in the face say thank you tell you about some of the positive things that are going on. I can tell you, Fallujah's ready for a super Walmart. I was just over there. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, one of, the, one of the Iraqi policemen, that I go over quite a bit. I work for the SAR Major of the Marine Corps. In fact, I'm going back later this month. But we always, you know, we deal with the same police and everything. <laughs> he said, no, you can take your, your flak and Kevlar off. I said, when you, guys get a, <laughs> when you guys open Walmart and open that casino you were talking about, I'll come back and I'll visit without my flak and Kevlar. But there's so many good things happening over there. Um, you know, the list can go on forever. But uh, you all know, we don't have to stand up here and tell, tell, you, tell all of you. But I want to thank the three of you for coming out here. It was really sp something special meeting you in Nashville. So I'll get off the pedal stool now. But Semper Fidelis, and God bless each and every one of you. And thank you. You know, Jeremiah can dislike the term hero all he wants. He's the one kept going back in that building. You know, that's what it boils down to. So, tough beans, buddy. <laughs> Our last speaker today uh, is a gentleman who uh, had a, a piece of what was a very important day for us in Iraq. Uh, I think I'm going to steal all Pete's lines here, but uh, everybody remembers when Ambassador Bremer came on the television and said we got him. All right, that was Saddam, and we needed to get him. He was the reason we went in. He was a problem. He was uh, dealing with terrorists, may not have been working operationally with Al-Qaeda. However, he was paying the families of Palestinian terror bombers. He was allowing other terrorists to live in freedom in Baghdad and have open offices. So the bottom line was he was a problem. He became no longer a problem through the efforts of uh, Colonel Steve Russell and other folks who did an awful lot of legwork as far as generating the intelligence and searching the area around Tikrit where Saddam was hiding. So basically, he commanded the infantry battalion that provided the security for the Delta guys who scarfed Saddam up 
and for that lucky interpreter who got to punch him in the eye. And I hope all of you have seen that picture. That was an Iraqi American interpreter who, after they snatched him out of the hole, the Delta guys looked at him and said, hey, this is Saddam, you're an Iraqi. You're the only one who's gonna get to do this. And he punched him right in his eye bone and gave him a nice big robin's egg. And if you haven't seen the picture, I'll post it at Black Flies, just so everybody can enjoy that and have a little you know, vicarious enjoyment. Bottom line, Colonel Steve Russell was, uh, like I said, the battalion commander of the infantry unit, provided the security and did the legwork to uh, make that happen. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Steve Russell. Well, we appreciate y'all coming out in the nasty weather. And uh, it's, it has been an honor to meet so many great Americans all over the country. Uh, we began March 14th in San Diego, and, and now here we are uh, just a, a couple of cities short of, of uh, getting to Washington, D.C. Uh, <clears throat> many people imagine the Saddam capture was an in instant thing, that it was uh, you know, some lofty intelligence handed down CIA operatives, uh, satellites, that type of thing. But it, it really wasn't. It was the result of very hard work on the part of just regular soldiers working hand in hand with a single Delta Force team uh, that was originally designated Task Force 20, Task Force 20 and then changed its designation uh, with a couple of adjustments later as Task Force 121. I had the absolute privilege of, of working just by geography. I commanded the forces uh, in Tikrit, Iraq. Uh, we got on to the trail of Saddam very early on. And as the, as the Delta guys saw the guys we were thinning out, they said, where are you getting this intel? Where's it coming from? I said, we're developing it ourselves you know, from human intelligence with the Iraqis. And we, we're able to learn that Saddam was protected by five controlling families, essentially, and that these families uh, had protected Saddam even before he left power. And as we learned who the adult males were in, in this network, we just began to go after them, much like the legs on a chair. If, if, if you kick the legs out from under it, you know, plop whoever's sitting in it is on the ground. We felt if we went after these uh, key men and leaders that were around Saddam, that, that that trail would lead us to the exact location where he was at, if he was still in the country. And we believe that he was, and uh, the Iraqis that we worked with, many informants said that he was. Over time, that's exactly what happened. We were able to pick up on that trail and get to that location. It was a fateful day. Uh, my battalion had the privilege to uh, be a part of the capture of the Ace of Diamonds, Abid Mahmoud, who was captured in uh, Tikrit in, uh, early on in June. We got uh, Adnan Abid al-Muzlit, who was Saddam's number one bodyguard. Uh, my battalion captured him in a surprise raid. And, uh, we got uh, the, the most important family protecting Saddam was the Muzlit family. Had eight brothers. We had scooped up a couple of those. Um, by the point where when we got the information for the final raid, which was commanded by Colonel Jim Hickey, which was my brigade commander uh, in the 1st uh, Brigade 4th Infantry Division, and then uh, I was showing some of the guys on the bus the actual operations sketch sheet that Operation Red Dawn was planned upon, you know, to show you the precision and the, uh, you know, lofty uh, intel. It was a butcher block sheet of paper thrown on a table and uh, commanders and, uh, and ops officers getting around and drawing a couple of circles, calling it Wolverine 1 and 2, or actually Objective 1 and 2 on the, on the sheet. And then uh, as far as the hit time, there was the, uh, uh, the Del Delta team commander, I'll call him John. He, he just draws on this, uh, let's assemble by the granary at 2,000-ish. How's that for precision? But that's really all we needed to put these raids together. We'd been on scores of them. We nearly got Saddam in July when we raided the Hadoshi farm. Uh, we didn't get him then, but we did get $10 million, uh, Mrs. Hussein's passport and identity card. Uh, we got over 500 pieces of her jewelry. We got the Saddam family photo albums, you know, pictures of uh, Kusei as a birthday party and how sweet. Uh, you know, Saddam at the beach, all of these types of things, kind of repulsive as you look at some of those family photo albums, which are at the National Infantry Museum, by the way, and you can go visit those. And so it was not an instant thing. It was a very methodical thing. And it wasn't just like 
people were coming in and out for you know certain raids scooping in and out it was daily fighting and grinding in addition to going on these raids for Saddam the enemy did not sit idle they hated our guts unlike some of the areas where you had um, a mix of Shia and Sunni and that type of thing it was a hundred percent Sunni Baathist that did not like us and they were um, they were very much um, in the employ of Saddam many of these guys many of them were Fedayeen Saddam as we come home now we've gone back and been able to piece together the, the forces that we were actually opposing and fighting as a commander I would go from company to company I commanded roughly a thousand soldiers with my attachments and um, they began to employ roadside bombs against us they began to uh, have these independent four-man cells connected to a, like a dozen uh, a dozen man team cells that would be out and they would plan these operations and ambush our soldiers one particular night uh, I'd got a call from my Charlie company commander and he had asked for a translator and I, I had one of the best ones in the battalion uh, as the commander guy had sacks of money in his car it didn't look right it was close to curfew and I said alright I'll, I'll be right there we'll bring a translator over so I had my small command element and we came to that location checks out two guys just sold a house we took them to the property the guy says yes you know here's the paperwork so it was a legitimate transaction we let him go actually we took them home uh, so they would get there safely and as I left uh, the company commander at that location a couple of Bradleys were thrown up soldiers in the area uh, but we had you know they had been there a while even though they had been doing little patrols around to provide security as I left that location and headed south, all of a sudden I heard RPGs uh, exploding behind me, uh, automatic weapons fire, and instantly the first thing that went through my mind is, okay, where the checkpoint was, the fields, there were fields to the north of that location, so they wouldn't be out in the fields launching an ambush, they're probably working in the residential housing areas. I was on that side in the housing areas heading south. So I shouted to my driver, I just said, go down and cut them off go down and take a left and, and cut them off and so we did we we went down one street and for whatever reason uh, my ops officer who was in the vehicle uh, with me as, as we were racing as fast as the Humvee could go he just shouted he said go one more street down now I don't know why he said that but we always went off our instincts I always told my my driver go with your gut if you feel like we should go right instead of left always follow your gut and he did and so we went one more street down as we came around that street and button hooked back up thinking that they would be using these back alleys for the ambush that they just launched on my guys um, as we skidded around the corner we saw a white Nissan pickup truck come flying around the corner it was dark uh, there were street lights uh, but there was not a lot of other light and I immediately from the corner of my eye as this Nissan pickup truck comes fishtailing around the corner saw RPGs AKs uh, masked men in the back with the black headdress all of that nonsense and um, so I knew at that point the game's on and uh, we had gotten considerably ahead of my security uh, detachment which was the headquarters soldiers and so I told my driver I just said cut him off and Cody Hofer six foot seven Crow Indian brave guy uh, made the cover of Time magazine in the March 04 issue um, he not only cut them off he drove right at them and smashed our Humvee into that pickup and uh, that allowed me to jump out of the vehicle and I began to shoot uh, the driver uh, the thing that was going through my mind is if I get the driver first the rest of the bastards can't get away and so I shifted fire to the two guys in the back I don't remember it because you know these things you get tunnel vision and things like this and you get very focused uh, they were shooting at me uh, but I had managed to get down and under them um, and hit the two guys in the back uh, of the uh, pickup truck uh, the guy with the grenade launcher big guy uh, he got out and was getting ready to launch a uh, an M79 a 40 millimeter grenade uh, at our guys and uh, Cody uh, cut him down uh, with very good uh, very good fire and so in in an instant ear splitting sound um, it was done and at the end of that those of you that have experienced it it's um, 
I let out a guttural, instinctive yell. I, I don't know where it came from, but it was just like, like I'd won a contest or something. And then I realized, hey, I still got a battalion to command here, and you know we're still in contact, and we got other things out here. So uh, my snipers had just engaged um, some insurgents that were using an ambulance. They had spotted them. They waited till they got a, a key point, lit them up. Uh, bottom line, at the end of that night, we ended up wiping out almost this whole insurgent cell of 12 guys that was led by Akuse's brother-in-law. Uh, so a very, I had, I had several soldiers wounded that night, but we didn't lose anybody, and the enemy came out uh, as usual on the bad end of, uh, of that contest. Over time, uh, when we look at the nature of our enemy and who we're fighting, I mean, these guys are not 20 feet tall. Uh, they can be beaten. And the people back home that say, well, there's just no way to take on these guys, that is sheer nonsense. Uh, we have the best training, the best soldiers, the best equipment, the best possible things that we could possibly hope for. And we have soldiers that are committed to win this mission and Marines that are committed to win this mission. When I came home from another war, I and I had served in Afghanistan, I'd served in uh, the initial entry forces that went into Kosovo, and I was absolutely amazed at the views being expressed by large numbers of the American people with regard to this war. It was almost as if the enemy was working hand in hand with people back home, calling the shots and saying, we need to quit, we need to give up, we need to pull out. Uh, we can't prevail, and I was like, where are they getting this stuff? They're not getting it from you uh, that have served there. They're not getting it from these guys. They're not getting it from me, and therein lies the problem. Uh, the sportscaster uh, that comments on the sports, you know, he might be a Heisman Trophy winner, or he might be a guy that, a recognized face that's played on the gridiron, and people know that he knows what he's talking about. Uh, the guy that talks about your money on some Saturday uh, morning news show is a guy that's probably made some. Um, who comments on the war in our media? Uh, like David Bellavia uh, you know, comically said, it's a guy that jams a copier in the back. Um, why is that? That's why we're doing this tour, is to get the soldier's voice into the national debate on this war. We absolutely can prevail. I told my guys that as long as I have breath, we will remember those that we lost over there. They're the true heroes. Uh, the rest of us had the privilege to fight and the privilege to serve our country and the privilege to prevail over evil enemies uh, that would want nothing more than to have us die and cause terror here at home. Uh, the real heroes are those that gave everything. And as long as we have breath, we need to remember their sacrifice and tell their stories, because no one else is going to do that. No one else will know those things. And, um, it will not be enough to remember our service and our sacrifice in this war on slabs of white marble and national monuments of black stone. That will not be enough. If we truly want to honor those who will never come home, who will never know the joys of marriage, who will never raise children, or live to a ripe old age to see their grandchildren and the very freedoms and security that their sacrifice purchase, then as a nation, we absolutely must honor their sacrifice with victory on the battlefield and victory and commitment by the American people here at home. God bless you. Thank you for letting us be with you here today. That pretty much encapsulates why we're here, all right? Ladies, we've talked before. Your husbands did what none of us wanted to do, but everybody knew could happen. And we will not, all right? We got a platform, we have voices, they will be heard, and they will be remembered. We promise you, that's a guarantee. Uh, I would like to thank some folks, thanks to the Retired Military Association for having us here on short notice. That was. Uh, Fortunate as, uh, as the other event fell through, uh, thanks to military.com for uh, setting up the event and, and taking care of the troops. We've got a couple gentlemen from uh, Ranger Up. I, I found out just last night that you guys have a website. Is that rangerup.com? Ranger Up is, is some former military folks. They make uh, very cool gear, 
and uh, you should check it out. And uh, it supports the troops and, and actually is, is fairly stylish, I found out. <laughs> RangerUp.com. <laughs> huh? Jeremiah Workman endorses RangerUp.com. <laughs> we can officially announce that right now. Actually, he's just hot for Grace, the t-shirt model, but we'll go ahead and let that slide. <laughs> no, seriously, we appreciate you folks coming out. And like I said, being at Fort Bragg uh, is a place where we all remember the long walk. All right, so we're ahead right now. All right, we were behind at halftime. We changed strategy. We're ahead now, and uh, we're going to tell people that, and we're going to make sure that the sacrifices of those who have given their lives and all those who have served and in any way, shape, or form been hurt or damaged by it get the treatment, get the love they deserve, like the Vietnam vets did not when they came home. Everybody who comes home from this war has been received well by America, and I think that's a tribute, and I think it's something we all need to maintain. So we'll keep the message going, and we appreciate your folks' support. Thanks very much. We'll, uh, we'll mingle now. We do a question and answer, but I think we can handle a, a, a mingle-a-thon right now. So if anybody wants to talk, we'll be around. Thanks.